Hi, hi. Well, what we need on this uh, Zoom cast is a critic. And, you know, the radio and television are married now. I mean, they never were. Radio used to hate television. Television hated radio, although television came from radio. And I, I think uh, motion pictures are somewhere in there. But, but the Internet has uh, played a good part in uh, separating us and then bringing us together. We don't know which way to go. Uh, the phone is, is actually directing the traffic. You get on your phone. The phone sends a signal to your house. It sends it to uh, your laptop. <clears throat> it's an electronic jungle that we live in. <laughs> uh, so we, we decided we're going to have all the great people on, these, on this series of shows that I'm doing, uh, people who deserve to be in the spotlight, but they aren't looking for it necessarily. But I, I'm looking for them because I know that they have greatness, and America's got enough... Uh, we got we got no problems to last uh, another another two planets and lifetimes. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, I want to I, I want to have the the excellence of people on the air, and they they are free willing. They say what they want and whatever they want to say they say, and nobody is prompting them. There's no script. Uh, it's not formatted, and yet I have a critic, a television critic, an actual one who actually did it for a living, <laughs> got paid. <laughs> And, uh, and, and has come to uh, write and be another great personality in his own right. Uh, and his name is Marvin Kipman. And Marvin, I would like to welcome you to the, uh, to the Reynolds Wrap here. How are you? <laughs> uh, uh, first, uh, uh, I want to say uh, I haven't seen you in so many years. So, uh, uh, yes. And I am Marvin Critic, as Marvin Kitman, as you say. And, um, yeah. So where I remember you, Joey, from the days when you were on radio. And if you'll forgive me for interrupting your opening speech there, because uh, I remember I barely got a chance to speak on your late night talk show. So I uh, feel it's very important for me to start speaking a lot even before you get wound up. And I, I, there are a couple things I want to say. For example, um, uh, I, I, um, I, I remember that, that um, you were the greatest of the late night talk show hosts. I remember that. So I just wanted to get that in. Well, and thank you. Also, <laughs> thank you. Secondly, I wanted to say that the reason uh, this country has been afflicted with Donald Trump as the president. The reason is because you went off the air in that <laughs> four-year period. Now, I don't know where you went. I couldn't follow. Uh, the program was always on too late at night for me to be listening to it and keeping up with. But I, uh, I, I think it's no coincidence that you're going off the air coincided with the rise of President Trump. Oh, so gee. Those, Thank you. That's, uh, but, but, you know, you've you got you to gotta tell everybody that you used to come to the show and fall asleep while I was... <laughs> that was, that was so <laughs> and your wife had to wake you up. She had to nudge you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I just wanted to get that off my chest because yeah. I know you'll start talking shortly and I will not have uh, a spare moment to fit things in. So I feel... Much better. Now I can talk to you. Secondly, I, I should point out that I am no longer a TV critic. Uh, you know, I worked for Newsday. Um, I was the TV and media critic there for 35 years. And um, in, at, at, at some point, um, uh, the... Um, the editors and I had a discussion and said that uh, you guys had given me an audition and 35 years later, we've decided it's not working out. 
<laughs> and that's when I stopped being a TV critic. But the skills that I developed of looking at um, television, I found that were useful um, in studying the post-television age, and which was the internet. So I decided that since I had been a, a major pundit as a TV critic, and I had been deciding, you know, what was good and what was bad on television, which of course was very difficult, I decided to become a pundit on the internet. And that's what I have been doing um, since we last spoke. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Now, uh, that's where I am. I'm on the internet, on Facebook and YouTube, and you probably uh, have some thoughts. Maybe you don't. <laughs> you have to remember, being a television critic affected my brain. 35 years of writing five columns a week, uh, really, I am not the same. Originally, I had one of the finest minds in Western civilization before I became a TV critic. And... Uh, and, you know, watching television, most TV viewers don't realize you use, you lose 15,000 white cells uh, a second when you're watching television. So this has a great impact. Oh, well, how, how many cells do you lose when you move to L.A.? Oh, it's <laughs> incalculable. Oh, you're now in L.A.? That's where you are? No, 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 no. I'm in Florida right now. This is the... Uh, I feel like I'm in a cell. <laughs> uh, I see. Now, listen, Marvin, uh, uh, I want to tell everybody that you wrote a book about Bill O'Reilly. That's when I first met you. Yes. That and, was... you wrote, and you wrote it with him. Well, not exactly. I had uh, 29 interviews uh, with Bill. Uh, he, uh, he grew up in Long Island and uh, I was his local TV critic. And uh, so he used to read my column all the time. And it was a great honor for him uh, to be <laughs> interviewed by me and to write a book. So uh, once a week for 29 weeks, we would sit down and I would be able to ask him anything uh, that I wanted. And the name of the book was the man who would not shut up the rise of Bill O'Reilly. Now, once the book was finished, uh, he had said that, oh, well, this is going to be a bestseller because I will mention it on the, uh, the program and you'll get thousands and thousands of sales. But at any rate, when he read the book, he decided that, he really could not mention the book at all. And so he didn't like his own story. Right. Now, the basic problem is I had one chapter, you know, I'm a reporter and a journalist, so uh, I had to have uh, this chapter about his phone sex problem. And, um, uh, and I... Uh, and he called me up one day and he said, Marv, I know as a journalist you have to cover this part of the story, but here's how you do it. Three sentences. Bill O'Reilly had a problem. Sentence two. Bill O'Reilly settled the problem. Sentence three. It's no problem at all. And uh, at the time, I had written three chapters with all of the details which I had gotten. And, um, and, but at any rate, you know, I had boiled it down to one, and that was enough to not only not publicize the book, but then he did me a special favor of calling all of his friends in talk re radio, mostly the, uh, people on the right and, uh, and 
the Black Bull don't have Kidman. Now, the great irony is that this book had actually said positive things about O'Reilly. I had really tracked his career for 25 years as a journalist, and I really had positive things to say. The only book to say anything positive except the six books he wrote about himself. <laughs> so this was a great idea. So his fans, what a, he was always being attacked as a motor mouth, you know, you know O'Reilly. Yeah. And here I was praising him as a journalist. Well, as it turned out, that as far as my own reputation goes, it's better that the book disappeared and, uh, because <laughs> my defense, you know, I, I had defended him saying, though, that phone call he was being blackmailed, that <laughs> the sad story of O'Reilly, uh, uh, you know, it's better. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm taken aback that uh, that that I'm interrupting my my current career to talk to you about Bill O'Reilly. That's <laughs> fine. So uh, you know, I'm uh, now Marvin, did he leave because of sex uh, talk on the phone or phones? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had uh, painted him as such a, a wonderful, like an altar boy. You know, the voice of God. And then it turned out he was spending millions paying off all of these people that he was talking to on the phones. So, uh, you know, but I don't want to talk about that. No, okay. Well, let's move along. Let's move along. I, I'm shocked that you <laughs> bring up this uh, terrible part of my past <laughs> as a writer. No, no, it's all part of your color. And, uh, you know, you, you've, you've done a great job of covering a lot of things. And you also have a, a very dry sense of humor, and you apply it to this administration right now, I'm sure. Uh, you you uh, no doubt are out uh, campaigning for Trump. Isn't that right? Uh, you know, my book, which is called Gullible's Travels, um, is the story I followed the president, well, I followed him as a candidate, um, from the very beginning, right? you remember that historic moment when he came down the golden escalator in the Trump Tower and, uh, and to um, the place was filled with these organized, spontaneous demonstrators <laughs> and the paid volunteers shouting, Trump for President Trump. Well, I started following. I had the feeling that this guy is going to be something historic. And I would have, my plan was to keep a journal, follow him, in step by step through the campaigns, which I assumed that he would lose. I never thought that the American people would be so stupid as to elect a totally inexperienced, unqualified, incompetent Nudnik as president. <laughs> but, but I looked at him as a journalist, and I, I was not going to be opinionated in any way. So I started following him as gullible's travels, and, um, and, and I'm the, the gullible one in this, as it turned out. And uh, I ran into a problem that looking at him, I had two problems with the president on television, which is how I mostly followed it, you know, as a, as a former TV critic and a, a media expert. The two problems, I found that I, there are some people that could not stand the sight of the president on television, and there were other people who cannot stand the sound of him. 
<laughs> but I had the worst problem. I could not stand either the sight or the sound of him. <laughs> I was getting sick after a couple of weeks of following every day. And, and as you know, he did dominate on me. So this created a problem uh, for my journal. And I decided to go to plan B. Plan B was to be like Trump, have no facts, do no research, and I'd be able to have a book. And I'm proud to say this book, Gullible's Travels, is uh, a, a wonderful report done in the Trump manner. So uh, you've become gullible yourself. You I are, am, you are the I am, <laughs> I am known as Marvin Gullible, as a matter of fact, <laughs> that I take advantage of the, uh, of the book and the, uh, the wonderful campaign that my publisher, Seven Stories Press, will be starting uh, on May 26th, as a matter of fact. It was just a quick, this is a very un histo important historic moment because this is the start of the campaign for the book. <laughs> well, I'm one of the most gullible people you ever meet, so uh, you're you're in a good spot with me. You you are in in uh, lucky to have been in the right place in the right time. <laughs> now, Marvin, let me let me uh, let me further this some more. Uh, you you, uh, I, I take it stop. that you're not gonna you're not gonna don't we stop Trump, with but, but wait. Do you Don't think we, we should have an election? Shouldn't we not uh, have an election at this time? Don't you think we should call it off until until we've solved the problem of the earth? Uh, you know, you raise a very important point. As I uh, write in the book, there is an eighty percent chance that we will have an election uh, on November third. I don't want to frighten any of your listeners, but what's going to happen um, is that uh, your president is going to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and um, and and think uh, um, sending he will send out a Twitter message, which <laughs> is the most important way documents are released in this administration, saying that due to the current situation, uh, the security threat at the border, the election is being delayed. <laughs> now, uh, you would think that that's absurd and insane, but on the other hand, uh, he has been saying totally insane things for three and a half years. And the most striking thing about the American people, or at least the base, the 34.9% that were responsible uh, for the election of the president, uh, people accept anything he says. And that, of course, is what the book is about all of the uh, things that he's been saying that people accept. So basically, if he were to do that, um, the, uh, uh, the people would say, oh, so what, they canceled the <laughs> election. <laughs> you know, and it's at the most, 65% of the people vote in an election, and that's a national election, even though we fight all these wars to bring democracy, to protect democracy, when it comes for the people to actually exercise what they're fighting and dying for, only 65% actually vote. So it's not that important, it's been exaggerated. And as a matter of fact, what would happen when the president uh, decides to temporarily delay elections? There would be a campaign um, on the media, especially on Fox, of the uh, 
people would say, yeah, why are we wasting all that money, all that campaigning, well, the, the, the time when, when uh, you know, people aren't that interested? Why are we having elections every four years, for example, when some countries have elections um, every eight years or 12 years, and he would point to his friend uh, Vladimir Putin, who is now up to 20 years. <laughs> Why not have this improvement in the democratic system in this country? But anyway, the book goes on to explain his reasoning for all of this and the general acceptance by the public. For so you got you got you got a book, and you're going to be on on every television channel except Fox. I, you will not be on 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 Fox I, with this book. I got a book, and very unfortunately, you know, we the country has a lot of problems, least of which is mine or fellow writers, but I have to, um, I have to um, face reality that what we have now is, is what I call uh, the Trump flu. And, um, and uh, to, to use, you know, he's such a, a great, medical man that he kept saying that this virus, uh, COVID-19, was really the flu. Uh, so it has been necessary for me to cancel the National Book Tour <laughs> to drop the gala book party uh, which everybody in the media was looking forward to, to not go to bookstores to have readings and book signings because there are no bookstores anymore and the few there are are closed down. So this has put a crimp in the sales campaign. So, Except, I, so now, now you're stuck with us. This is a big deal. <laughs> this debut of the campaign on on what's your name again? Yeah, show. it's it's Joey Zoom. <laughs> Joey show. Yes. So as a matter of fact, I sent out. You know, I have a a, a big following over the thirty five years. I sent out a bulletin which I want to read to you. It's a few paragraphs. The headline is, Kitman Book Tour Axed by Virus. Quote, I will not risk the lives of my family or yours, left, let alone my own, not to mention hundreds of TV anchors and cultural reporters by selfishly traveling around the country spreading germs and book news. I know that President Trump, the subject of my expose, Gullible's Travels, would want it that way. That's because it will save him having to suppress it by suing me and calling me Crazy Kitman and Moscow Marvin at his next press conference. <laughs> You are a true journalist, but why are you wearing that visor? Is that like a print thing, you know, when you're a, a reporter? I'm an old-fashioned guy. Yeah. And, you know, I have not yet accepted the reality of having a little piece of plastic and standing on the corner of my street in New Jersey and being able to talk to people in San Francisco or in Florida yeah. or in London. Yeah. So this idea of the Zoom, I frankly don't believe that this is actually happening and that we are just sort of playing. Yeah, this is a conspiracy, it. right. I, I, so you, know, you know, one of the things that's going on here is uh, my vice, used to have 
they used to call uh, reporters and print people, uh, they were hex. And we were, the talk people were yaks. So we had the hacks and yaks, if you recall. No, I don't and, mean. Yeah, we, we met uh, somewhere along the line. But what happened to the yaks or the hacks that used to be on television? We don't have the Walter Cronkites and those people anymore. Where did they all go? Well, that is really sad. And the saddest thing, and which I haven't written about yet, is I'm still in disbelief, is the disappearance of Chris Matthews. That used to be, in all my years of the research for the book, the starting hardball with Chris Matthews. One day, out of the blue, he suddenly disappeared. I don't know if you watch television, you don't have time. Well, it's probably hardball. phone sex. So, yeah. so it, was, it was like a, a trap door underneath the anchor chair open and boom, he disappeared. And there was some like for, for there, there was a, a snippet saying that he had some, some problem. It was never clear what the problem was. But <clears throat> do you spend, do you spend all of your time with politics or do you, do you write about anything or think about anything else? Frankly? Only politics. How come? Politics has everything. It's our satire. For example, politics makes, uh, you know, without the president, what would the late show, the... the, uh, the entertainment? The entertainment? Yeah, the uh, late night talk show. Oh, host. forget those guys. Those guys are all what, stand -up, they're all stand-up comics. Would they, what would they have to talk about if not for the president and his tweets? Well, so they've made it that way, though. Uh, they think the public wants that, and I don't agree. I think the public wants to be entertained. Have you ever seen Blue Bloods? You see that with Tom Selleck? You ever watch a good show on television? No, I haven't seen. You that. don't watch those things. How about no, the morning shows? I, Who do you I, like I, on the on the morning? I, Who do you let like? Me, let me confess that I never watched television before I became a TV critic, and. Um, and I stopped watching television as soon as I stopped being paid to watch it. <laughs> Why would I watch that for free? So I am not kept up with, uh, with uh, the programming, and I hear that it's pretty good now. I'm not surprised. For 35 years, I was giving all of these suggestions about what was wrong with it, so sure, it improved, and and I, in all modesty, I take credit for it. And I, I should explain, you know, I've been influenced by the president. Um, that I take credit for all the good things that happened, and uh, anything bad that happened is not my fault. So, well, do you believe that we're a vast wasteland? The president said that. Newton Minow said that to Nixon, well, I think it was. Is this a vast wasteland? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not watching it. This, seeing you, I'm reassured that if you are back, it can't be all bad. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and it's I used to love your show. And uh, be, being on it, I mean, it, it really really made my midnight hour, you know, I would come down and try. We never, we, we never talked try, about politics. We never to, did politics. No, no. Well, then I was still a critic, a TV critic. <laughs> when, and um, How, where, did, where did you start? Where did you, you, were you born in Brooklyn or somewhere in the boroughs? I was born in the city of Pittsburgh. Oh, that's why you got the Steelers thing on. You know, I programmed KQV in Pittsburgh. I was a program director there. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And well, we were in, we, we had a window in the, in the Chamber of Commerce building. We'd do the shows from the window. Oh, I knew And that. I, had a, I had girls wet themselves down with T-shirts, and that was the end of that routine. <laughs> hey, listen, oh, you know, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh is next to godliness. You know that. So, uh, at any rate, 
my parents, you asked where I came from and how I emerged. My parents took me um, to Brooklyn for the schooling. Um, some Pittsburgh families sent their kids to Switzerland to go to school, but mine brought me to Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, so I grew up there, but I never lost the, the, the heart of, you know, being a great American was having a team to root for. And my passion was the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pittsburgh Penguins. So life was nice and complete. Yeah, well, I spent a lot of time at Kennywood Park. My family is from Cannonsburg originally. And uh, a, a piece of it, you know, uh, the D'Amico family, and they, they were also, my, my cousin worked with Perry Como as a barber, if you go back that far. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that, that's, but so I have a little tie in, and I have a lot of friends from Pittsburgh uh, who I still talk to because having been a program director, I, I turned the city upside down. Uh, I, I, I started a monument, which was the Tomb of the Unknown Bowler. And I had people come to worship. Uh, also, I, I, I pissed off the mayor because I hired him to do the morning show on KQV. So he would be on. Pete Flaherty was his name at the time. Oh, and Pete Flaherty was on the air uh, with us until 9 o'clock. And then he got in the, in, the, in the town car and went to City Hall and did his job. But we paid him as a morning host. And so we actually did have the morning mayor. He was the real mayor. And, and I, I hired him. We did so many different things, but he kept getting mad because I was referring to it as Pipsburg. And I, and I never, and, and on the signs, I spelled KQV, K-A-Y, C-U-E, V-E-E. -E. You know, I, I never got the name of the city or the station right. That was the gag. But, you know, it used to make everybody mad because Pittsburgh is a Renaissance city and they're so filled with pride. You know, it never got to be Philly. Yeah. But, you know, the... Uh, the, the Alleghenies are a little different than, the, than, than going across the, that place where they have the, the independence. You know that building? It's not only just as long as I brought this up. Um, Jewish, is it William Penn that's on top of that building in, in Philly? So when you're coming over the bridge, yeah. it looks like he's taking a leak, but he's holding a sword down, and it looks at, like he's peeing on the whole city of Philly. <laughs> yeah. They never liked that either. But you got out of Pittsburgh, and then you went to Brooklyn, and you made a career in, in, in writing. Did you get into newspapers right away, or television, or what? What did, what did you get into? Uh, my first uh, job as a journalist was with a racing paper. And, uh, and uh, the Armstrong Daily and the National Program. And um, I, I used to be in charge of the non-racing news. And I used to have a column there called the 11 Lively Arts. And uh, it was an excuse to write about anything. So I used to review things like the uh, Guarini uh, Chamber Orchestra's latest concert. And, uh, and it used to puzzle the uh, the readers, you know, who would buy the paper just for the information about the races and wanted uh, Guarini, they would look for some kind of code that I was giving about the day's uh, hot fix. And uh, that's that's how I started. So you started you started writing in a paper, but how did you get over to the radio and TV part? Well. Um, I, uh, the, my first job as a TV critic was at the New Leader magazine. Now, this is, was like the New Republic and the Nation. And, uh, and they had a, a TV critic in the, back in the 1960s who died, and nobody wanted to become a TV critic then because it was such a, a dead story TV was so bad in the 50s and the 60s that, uh, okay. So they approached me, the editor approached me, and I said, uh, you know, that's nice that you offer me the job, but I, I never watch television. Um, 
And I used to, growing up in the 50s as a writer, I used to, every, all the educators and social scientists would say, TV would make you lose your mind. It was such a bad influence. And as a, a budding writer, the mind was the most important thing to me next to my fingers that I needed for typing. So, uh, you know, I, I just didn't watch any of all the terrible programs, uh, except that I would uh, watch the baseball games, the few times that the Pirates were on um, New York television, whenever they played the Giants or the Dodgers. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, so I, you know, I had no knowledge. And they said, great, we'll increase your fee and uh, we'll double it. So eventually I got paid in the high two figures to um, the TV critic there. And once a month I wrote a column for me as a famous literary guy who was watching television for the first time. And, uh, you know, it's very much like my, my gullibleness in, in, in politics. And, and also the Internet. Are you, are you, have you embraced it? And uh, so, um, so at any rate, one of the, they had 20,000 readers, one of whom was uh, uh, Bill Moyers, was the publisher. So they hired me at Newsday. And the great thing is, they, they, I had five columns a week to write about television any way I wanted. So I was not like um, the, um, the New York Times critic who would only write about Channel 13 public television. No matter what kind of boring stuff they had, John O'Connor would write along um, in, before him, Jack Gould, and um, and it was if that channel, if public television had sent him a TV set with only thirteen on the dial, <laughs> and uh, but I would write about things in a totally different way, and we don't have time. You know, I've been talking so much; I haven't given you a chance to say anything. No, I've said plenty. I, I want to know if you uh, have embraced the internet, embraced this new media or the technology, or did you just say, oh, forget about it? No, I have, oh, well, I have a great website. It's marvinkitman.com. And, um, and, you know, for, for years, I've been writing on the internet. And you must look at it sometime. And it has my book, Gullible's Travels, which is coming out on May well, well, besides the book, I'm trying to figure out some other things you're doing. <laughs> we know the book is here they're and it's, all, it's arrived, but what are you doing? <laughs> they're all on marvinkitman.com. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm commenting on world affairs, and literary affairs, and it's all, you know, I, w one of the m more important things that I did, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, as a television critic in 35 years, I basically became uh, Ill illiterate. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and um, I had stopped reading books and um, for all those years. So I decided that um, it was time to start reading again. And the book I chose was War and Peace. <laughs> and, um, and, I'm a slow reader. I don't know. Uh, yeah, and, and that happens to be a big book. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big book, but it only took me six months to read it. <laughs> and then I, I did this fantastic review because 
I'm, you know, I hang out with a lot of literary types and professors and at cocktail parties. Yeah, you, well, know, you, didn't, you didn't hang out with Tolstoy. No. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, he, Leo Baby, as I call them. <laughs> um, and uh, so as I was reading this book, I would try to engage uh, these scholars, you know, in, in War and Peace. And everybody said, oh, you know, they were supposed to have read it in college and et cetera, et cetera. But most people had not read this. But since I was demonstrating the value of reading, um, you know, I went through the whole thing. And it's an amazing book, you know, when you actually read it and, and not, you know, Woody Allen, for example, his review was, it's a book about Russia, period. <laughs> that was his whole review. But I, I discovered that Tolstoy was a great war correspondent. His scenes describing the battles, Napoleon's march through Russia were just incredible. And, and I, you know, and it led me to a study of Napoleon, who was really quite stupid as a general. And he never gets credit for that. And um, <laughs> but but also th there is uh, I don't know if you were a Mason or not, but my father was a Mason, and you know, powerful group, and they have all these secrets. And uh, I would ask my father every month. He would go to a Masonic lodge. Be what's this all about? What did I know? And he would say. I, if I told you, I would have to kill you. So he never told me what the Masonic rituals were about. But Tolstoy, in the middle of this humongous book, has all of these secrets about their meetings. So it, it was a great... But I, at any rate, I, I wrote one of the most important essays in my life about the reading of War and Peace, which... I know you, you're probably a good reader. If you look it up in um, you not only will you have the series called the Trump Onicles, which are the details of my gullible travels through the three and a half years so far. So we're, if we read all this, I won't have to buy your book. It's okay. <laughs> because the important thing is not just making money from a book, but the education of people. You'll find that I'm very noble that way. How did you like? How did you like Bernie Sandler? Bernie, who? Yeah, the guy from uh, from New England who was trying to be president. Oh, you mean Bernie? Yeah. How did you like him? You know. You don't seem to know that I am a Republican, a registered Republican. And um, and also, you don't seem to know that I ran for president as a Republican, and I lost. That, that was, you, you don't seem to know a no. lot of, for an educated guy, you seem to know very little about me, I must <laughs> say. I, I, sometimes I wonder why I bothered to talk to you <laughs> <laughs> but anyway i didn't all i knew about the the democrats during the the, the fights that they were having i mean I, and and once again on marvinkitman.com you'll see the section called the suicide watch where i wrote about the way they had 25 candidates who was spending valuable time knifing each other, not only in the back, but in the front, in their stupid debates, and which I thought they were killing themselves when they had such an easy target in Trump, who day after day was doing 
idiotic things. And, uh, and there they were fighting about the fine print of, of a plan, of a health plan, which would never come to being because it had to get past Mitch McConnell in the Senate. So that was the suicide watch. So I, <laughs> I, I, but then as it turned out, you know, that that was particularly a waste of time given what has happened now. Are we going to uh, so solve this uh, virus pretty quick here? What do you think? Well, I, I think uh, the way the president is handling it, the answer is no. I mean, when, you know, I, I you know, he is our president, and, and you, you, you have to know my book, says a lot, you know, he, he talks about the enemies of the people. And I always wonder, you know, the press, I always wonder who he's talking about. Because in my book, I claim, uh, I was the first pundit to say this, that he is the best president we have. And this was a, a really positive endorsement of the man. So, um, I, 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 Okay, so I, but the thing, I, you know, we're running out of time, I'm sure, and you have to read the book to see all the details of all the positive <laughs> things. You have, you have said people. the book more times than anybody in my 15 years people. at WOR. Do you know people. that? People. I've never heard anybody mention a book more than you, and I've had a show for 15 years. People. People. You know, we used to say, we, we had a saying <laughs> that we used to brief the guests on one thing don't say you have the book and you violated every single one of those rules you 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 did nothing but promote your book <laughs> it should have been on my shoulder all the time i know i mean that's, and you know myra channon who was my producer would say she would oh, brief you and say you can say anything you want you can even use the f word we'll bleep it but don't say the book <laughs> and what you've done is you you hit me with the book <laughs> and of course I started it because I brought up the book about Bill O'Reilly yeah that really threw yeah, me so off that, that's, that started you know, it off and then we got into this other crap and you know there's a lot of people that like Trump but they call him the, uh, he's going to go to the Ford Motor Company without a mask and he's, and he's taking the disease uh, the malaria cure for the wrong virus I mean do you have that in your in your book <laughs> I was the first one to defend him as an idiot. You know, <laughs> he was called an idiot, and I would said that said that uh, no, he's not an idiot. He's a moron, and it's a big difference. But at any rate, that's all explained my defense of the president. And if he is an idiot, I said in a positive way, he is America's idiot <laughs> because that is why he got elected. Because as you know, there are idiots in every village in the country, and sometimes two or three of the idiots. So, but anyway, that's all in the defense of, of the president. Uh, but I've learned something very powerful from you before we Reynolds wrap this up here, and that is that you have taught me that stupid is okay. The president, that's right. Not only him, I'm applying it to me. Stupid is good. <laughs> Not only is stupid a positive characteristic, but the great thing we've learned from the president is it's okay to lie. You know, when we grew up, if you lied, that was a bad thing. You really felt embarrassed and you would disappear from the scene. But there are scientific studies, and I mentioned this in the book, that prove you know, answer the question, how can you tell when the president is lying? The answer is, if his mouth is open, he's lying. <laughs> this is a scientific. So well, I, I must tell you that uh, you, you, if you were Catholic, you would have been punished by the nuns in Pittsburgh. You would have been sent to the home for the relatively unimportant in McKeesport. Because you, you definitely have, uh, have, have struck my fear. Uh, the fear is that we could sit here for all this time and talk about Trump again, which I hate when we do that, because that's what everybody does on late night television. 
but we managed to turn a whole show into your book. Gullible <laughs> Travels. I know. I know the title. And, and, the, and have, Marvin uh, Kitman is the website. I know that. Marvin Gullible himself. <laughs> Thank you, Marvin. Thank you for Thank being here. How's, how's Carol? She's fine. I'll pass the word on. All right, tell her I said hi. Uh, you know, all these all these hours that uh, she's falling asleep listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, as they say. Oh, hey, listen, I want you to I want you to go on another show and try this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Marvin Kipman. He's a great guy and a good friend. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks for being here tonight or this That's morning, cool. or whenever. The whenever when you're on when you're on. Uh, Demand, or what do they call it now? Assigned viewing. Yeah, this is assigned viewing. Uh, let this be assigned to you. Thank you. <laughs> the book. <laughs> uh, let a smile be your last above. words. Shelter in place and don't drink the Clorox. This is my this is my book. Let a smile be your umbrella, but don't get a mouthful of rain. 